Well, thank you and good afternoon and uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, as it was mentioned, I have the wonderful job of being the historian and curator at Old Government House, which is, uh, since probably nobody else is here, um, I'm going to say is probably one of Queensland's most important heritage buildings, um, or the most important now. Uh, nobody's here to challenge me. Uh, it's located within the QUT campus or Gardens Point campus um, in QUT, and QUT is the custodian of this building and employs myself and an additional staff uh, to help me. Also, we have other elements to it. It's a working building. We have an event staff as well. So I'm going to acknowledge straight up that I do have a budget. I am well funded, I am well sponsored, um, and that makes my life a lot easier because I know that they're the types of things that very much consume um, heritage museums um, and getting money and resources to do uh, the things that I get to do. That doesn't stop me complaining though, but that's okay. Okay, so Old Government House is a not-for-profit museum which is open free of charge six days a week. It offers a vital link to Queensland's early colonial history and life. I'll better give you a bit of a photo to give you something to look at. And the museum presents the remarkable story of all who lived and worked in the house and offers the visitors a unique educational um, experience, heritage experience, that's how I put it. <clears throat> it's really important, um, really at the outset for me, to also acknowledge that I see myself as an historian first, that's my professional training, and as a curator secondly. Okay. And, and that's kind of vital to what I wanted to talk about today. Um, historian is a fairly fluid term, um, it has multiple definitions, a factor that is brought home to me regularly when I uh, ask 12 year olds, what do you think an historian does? Um, this is a question that I use after introducing myself as an historian and so as to initiate a connection between the concept of history and the past. My role also and the implied importance of the 150 year old building that the school group is visiting. As you might imagine, I get some really wonderful answers to that from 12 year olds. Um, and fairly, some of them are fairly accurate, examines the past to learn what happened and reads lots of books or just looks at old stuff. <laughs> Last week I got, uh, spends a lot of time on Google. <laughs> okay. But it, it was uh, during the busy end of last year when an exhausted group of school kids and uh, teachers uh, were standing at the entrance to Old Government House that I received arguably the funniest response and perhaps it's also a problematic response. So after introducing myself and saying I'm an historian, I ask, what do you think an historian does? There was that link few seconds of silence where every student avoids eye contact hoping that another would answer the question and then when it got a bit painful the answer came. To set the context a fraction more I welcome school groups in the doorway of the museum so they can just peek in and on this one day one of my colleagues um, was walking through the door and as the answer came it stopped her in her tracks and she laughed and just kept walking. So what was the response to what do you think an historian does? It was not much. <laughs> uh, I was initially speechless, um, which I can assure you doesn't happen very often. And while I thought it was hilarious, my response was, let's, well, let's go inside and see if that's true. Okay, and more on that later. Everyone and everything has a past and this presents an infinite number of topics to investigate, whether out of pure interest or to reveal an untold story or historical event. Historians are the investigators, detectives of the past. We endeavour to present new ways to look at, revel in and value our history. We are, in the simplest terms, nosy storytellers that I am constantly learning and that my focus approach is constantly changing is at the core of my presentation today. But it did present me with the dilemma of how to tell the unfolding story of my experience with one key building in a way that was both interesting and worthy of sharing after lunch. 
In telling our own stories, we all pluck out or focus on crucial times, events and people in our lives. And not surprisingly, the focus changes at different stages of our life. This too is a familiar pattern of my approach in interpreting the history of Old Government House. It's not quite big enough. So in 2007, when I was first appointed, my role was, in a nutshell, to research and write the content and to develop a range of interpretive displays to, in collaboration with an exhibition design company. Nothing particularly extraordinary there. But the key to this is I didn't present the usual attributes associated with a typical historic house, that being a large and varied collection of objects. And I have readily and naturally had to focus on creating links to what happened in the house and on who lived and worked here. So I wanted to frame my talk today on two quotes that really have underpinned or expressed the best way my approach to researching and presenting the story of a 150-year-old building with no furniture and no objects, well, except for the building itself. Okay, the first one. Heritage spaces are acknowledged as places of aesthetic reference, a connection to periods of time and a reference to people who lived, built, worked, played or explored them. Okay, the other one. We dream in narrative, remember, anticipate, hope, despair, believe, doubt, plan, revise, criticise, construct, gossip, learn, hate and love by narrative. In order really to live, we make up stories about ourselves and others, about the personal as well as the social past and future. So it is the story, and how that story, our stories was presented, was therefore pivotal in any effective interpretation of this landmark colonial building. I had to ensure that the stories would resonate with our visitors and make them, uh, made because they were informative, surprising and engaging. Okay, before I uh, go on on how I did that, um, I wanted to give you a bit of context on the history of the house, obviously. Old Government House is the only purposely designed and constructed residence for the Governor. It was completed in 1862. It was occupied by vice regal families, uh, uh, 11 of them, up until 1910. In 1900, well, I better give you some more photos. It was built for uh, George and Diamantina Bowen, okay, our first governor. It cost a whopping £19,000. Um, that is an extraordinary sum of money in the sense that our first year income was expected to, it estimated to be about £100,000 and we had a total population at the time of 25,000 people. Nice bit of debt to start us all off. Um, but it's also a great signifier of how important this building was to the people of Queensland that we would invest such amount. Um, the building, as I said, was used as a vice regal residence. Okay. And then, in a political move, uh, it was handed over to be the inaugural building of the University of Queensland. Okay. So, in 1910, Sir William McGregor moved out. And when he passed through the gates, um, it became known as Old Government House, and he was moving to Temporary Government House while New Government House was being um, built. But Temporary Government House uh, is now Permanent Government House, and it's Fernberg. Okay. So on the 10th of December, Queensland's uh, 50th anniversary, Sir William McGregor uh, officially handed over the building to be the inaugural uh, university building and McGregor moved out in June the following year. Um, then the house was stripped of all elements of its vice-regal nature and it was turned into university or an administrative or academic building. And uh, in April 1911, uh, 84 students turned up for their first classes. So what's really wonderful about that is that 26 of them were women and this was the first time that women could enter university uh, at the beginning of a university's career. Um, but anyway, that aspect of this story I haven't told and that's because of time and um, just haven't got to it yet. So but it's a very important part. Okay, so here's the building. It is a 
taken over progressively by QIT, um, which would be called Tech College, QIT. Uh, university needs more buildings to provide really ugly architecture around it. So they want to demolish this building. Um, and thankfully, there was a quite a uh, campaign to not have that happened. And it, it's really the beginning of the National Trust in Queensland, and the building is saved. The National Trust occupies it for a number of years. Um, but in 2002, they conceded there was too much for it to, um, it just couldn't financially fix the building up. So this is one of the last photos taken of it before the restoration. And then $15 million later, um, didn't come out of my budget, uh, we've addressed uh, some of the key issues. And at that time, $15 million was an extraordinary amount of money. Um, then came City Hall. Um, and that changed it massively. Uh, the house was closed for two years. We dealt with a massive problems of structural problems, um, termites, asbestos, and all sorts of elements. Okay. It is also a building that is in the middle of a campus, okay? But it's a beautiful building. So to give you uh, some insight into what we're looking at, I get to go to work here. It's tough. Okay. So one of the elements about the building is it's an empty shell, okay, and this is a couple of things that were very important. Also, in creating or populating an empty shell, you need to create uh, or find the stories in the history. And we came across a couple of different things. And one I'd just like to touch on because it's one of those uh, eureka moments but also uh, not at that same time. And that is the problem that I have with the Vice Regal residence is that it was covered by protocols of secrecy. And that basically meant that what happened in the house stayed a secret in the house. It meant that you get very few uh, anecdotal evidence, which is a large resource for most historians. Now, by design, colonial government houses were purposely built as places of power. And not surprisingly, most interpretations have inevitably focused on the lives of the white, often upper class male residents who occupied the role as governor. But beyond the scenes at each government house was a veritable army of men and women who generally outnumbered the front of house occupants. And they worked to ensure the lives of the governor and his family ran as comfortably and smoothly as possible. And these were the household staff. The floor plan of this house is here. Uh, you probably can't really see that, but it is a, uh, a very much set up to keep the rear of staff, house staff, away from the front of the house. Okay, we have the. You're all very familiar with the concept of upstairs and downstairs, but in the colonies, the British colonies, much more space. So it's front of house and rear of house. So I have this map. I can actually give you, it's a very well documented house in the sense that the public, pro, public works uh, department looked after it. But in the fact that I can actually detail the records on how many number of pine tables um, were in the kitchen and the scullery and the servants hall, as well as the types of brushes the housemaids used and what cooking utensils were preferred in the kitchen, I actually don't have the names of the people who used them. Okay. And this is the kind of interesting element that emerged to me over a period of time. And objects, you know, as we saw this morning, are great to uh, prompt discussions and elements like that. But it is the fact that it's people that we connect to, it's our stories um, that we do. And this was the stories of the everyday person and the servant who uh, my visitors, as a rule, generally prefer to hear about rather than the guy in the really tight white pants. Okay. So one of the elements about this is trying to research that as an historian rather than the curator role which is coming along. And I did lots of research and I came across this picture. And this was a fantastic picture for me um, because it was obviously of the working class. Now, in the time that I got today, I just wanted to break this down. Um, and we were talking about photos before. Um, in the sense that, you know, he wanted to take a photo. This is a time when photography is very expensive. This is also glass negatives. Um, it's a it's an ex slow exposure. So all of these people are being pulled from their work environments, okay, to position themselves in this photo. 
Um, and there's a hierarchy in there that I can decode. So what's really fascinating is that he went to all this trouble to create this photo and, and his descriptor, his only um, descriptor was uh, government house servants. Okay. So he didn't feel the necessity to pass on the names of these people, um, but he, you know, he took this photo. So in one respect for me, this was a fantastic moment. It indicated the size of the servants class um, or service, household servants, yet at the time it raised more questions than that. Collectively, I've been doing lots of research on them and I've only uh, managed to identify 44 individuals as domestic servants and um, in almost 50 years. And it's estimated that a number closer to about 200 would be representative of sort of a medium staffing level. And further, that the number of household servants or staff um, was recognised as a higher status, we would expect more at Old Government House. And I won't go too much into it. But one of the uh, interesting uh, side notes, and this is one of my uh, charms and it still makes me laugh, but is that uh, the place that found most information was uh, the reporting of court cases in the newspaper. Okay, and these are kind of element, and uh, you know, there's one particular court case where, as I sort of say in, in my thing, is that it was really a case of the butler who really did do it, and uh, he, he got a housemaid uh, pregnant, and uh, there was a court case about paying support for him. But uh, his full name was Mr. Albion Wise, and that is the only time a butler is given the full name of a butler in 50 years at. Uh, at this vice regal residence, and the butler is the highest um, person staff member in in a household this size. So there's a lots of different um, aspects of having uh, lack of information. Cool. So this, sorry, these are just some of the people I've identified from these. This is sort of kind of an interesting little thing and I will read this because I did get a lot of stuff out of this and it's kind of humorous. But uh, the sort of odd looking chap um, in the, with the hat is uh, Wellington, William Wellington Cairns, and uh, he was a governor who, in, in a great sense of England, um, Queensland irony, um, couldn't stand the heat, so we named him one of the most northern towns after him. But um, he was an odd man, and that uh, is probably the best way. His own uh, private secretary, who's on the on whatever way, the other side, Alfred Maudsley, actually described him as a very odd man. And he was. That's a very nice way. But Alfred Maudsley, in a letter to his sister in 1875, um, repeated in a book um, that he published called Life in the Pacific 50 years ago, broke with the protocols of secrecy and gave us a rare and intriguing insight into the importance of having good household servants. And Maudsley detailed the chaotic consequences of the governor's ad hoc hiring policy. And I'm just going to read you this quote, give you... This was a springboard for me for lots of other stuff. Of the five men who came out, three, including the butler, have already been discharged. They really were a bad lot. There remains Thomas, aged 22 years, the coachman who drives very badly. Two men, stewards, one, a scoundrel, has been sacked, and the other, Roberts, has been promoted to house steward. He is rather imprudent and with a queer temper and has now been given by the governor complete charge of the household, though the other servants dislike him. Next comes Hopper, a nice youth, aged 21. He came out intending to go up country but was captured on landing and taken into the household. He is a very good fellow but knows nothing about waiting or housework. Cook, we have none. The French cook engaged at Café Anglaise in Paris has gone. The wife of another immigrant, and this is the husband, had been put to work in the stables though he had never touched a horse before. <laughs> the wife is the cook and she ruins a leg of mutton or a joint of beef in her attempts to prepare them for our dinner. The beef steak she cooked for breakfast today was very cold when it came to the table and on inquiry we were told that it had been found necessary to wash it before bringing it in. <laughs> and this is vice-regal life. Okay. 
So I can unpick all that, but it gives you fascinating insight. And it's not quite surprising that within a year, Alfred Maudsley um, left Kansas employ and took up a post with Sir Arthur Gordon in Fiji. Remember, this is 1875, and it would seem that uh, Fiji was a better place to be in 1875 than to be working for Governor Kans. Okay. So with all these issues, uh, you know, I came together to try and create a museum. And uh, the best way to show you of what I did was really just to put it in pictures. So we claimed uh, three of the uh, downstairs rooms um, as museums. And uh, uh, this um, is the museum entrance, which is the introduction and the layout and style of the house. And you walk in and this gives you the who, what, when and why. Okay. We talk about a lot of the elements. We actually focus more on the household staff than on the governors. Um, and this has proved that people are interested in this element. Okay. We have a number of touch screens. Okay, so what was really, it's nice and appealing is that uh, after the chaos of pulling it all together, we uh, managed, uh, we won a uh, competition, well, uh, we were awarded a Governor's Gold Medal and, and another Museum and Galleries Award. And that's all really well and it looked great and it was fantastic. Um, but what worked and what didn't, okay. One of the key things to remember, and if you remember those photos, is that I have a working building and three of the build, three of the rooms are empty. So the question that really sort of brings a, a, a left eye twitch to me is, where's all the furniture? Okay. And this is where this object-focused approach to being a house museum. But rather wonderfully, the element and the way that we've rejiggled a few things, I think that we've sort of managed to get over that. And so you may not be able to read this, but I just took a couple of uh, images from my visitor's book. And, uh, and it really is, it, you know, makes me feel great because I think people are really getting it, what we're doing there and about the, the, the value of the building. But it's still a working building. It needs to have events to raise money to keep it going. And so I've got some, you know, ones that you probably can't read, but beautiful and interesting. Um, Can I move in uh, is a common one until night time. Um, but uh, it's a lovely building. And that, then one, and the next one is fabulous and so proud of it. Um, protect your heritage with someone from South Africa. So it has been very successful. Uh, we've had a lot of people come through, but a couple of things that you don't think about from left field um, have made life more difficult. One of the things, so I'm just going to show you this and flick to the next one. So what didn't work? Uh, in the design phase we, of the restoration project, i.e. I wasn't involved, um, and I probably wouldn't have picked this up, was that the public entrance to the house was moved. So you're looking at the building front on. The large tree, which is the bunya pine tree, um, was the governor's uh, office, and that was the traditional entry for most people. And the other side of the building is the private family side of the uh, building. Um, it was considered that we would make the Governor's Library a stately or ceremonial office um, in line with what it was originally and that we would uh, welcome people in through the private drawing room. Um, this hasn't worked uh, and it's been a massive problem. We've spent a lot of money on signage um, because I constantly have people trying the doors to come in through the element. It's, it's also a great testament to Charles Tiffin who was the architect. Uh, he designed it that way, that was the public access side of the building and it's frustrating but I acknowledge he did a very good job. We're now going to be using larger banners to try and say go to the other side in a polite way. Um, but again, that wasn't something I would have thought about. Predicting a visitor pathway. Uh, well, look at the uh, element of the, you cannot predict, I would argue. You cannot predict a visitor's pathway. You can try and give an arm a, a access on each side. Um, one of the really interesting things that I have discovered is that people will come in and do it whatever they want. But we can see there, that's my visitor service assistant and her desk is there. 
Exactly opposite her is this really vital uh, panel, um, and it is sort of the how Queensland came around and the building of the house. Him built in it is a touchscreen. It talks about the 3D structural changes, how the house has evolved. What we find is that because it's touchscreen and the vast majority of my visitors um, through the day are retired or, or you know, not young like me, no, I'm joking. Um, and there's, there's a privacy issue. They want to engage with the technology, but they don't want to do it in full view. Okay, so we are moving it uh, or replicating it to another room where people can interact with it um, and that sort of element. Um, the depth of information, this is where my training as an historian um, really crept in and you know I transferred from historical information gathering and writing to didactic panels and short uh, punchy bits. Um, but too much information is, is, is destroying and a lot of panels have too much information. So I created this layered approach where I was presented the biography of the governor and his family and key events. Now uh, we can track through that and see how that's going, but you know, not, no one is no one is investigating it. So there is this level of having too much information. Um, also, uh, another element of providing information externally because this is Queensland's house. Um, it means that people should be able to come and visit it from all over the Queensland um, through the web mainly. And again, click-throughs on this indicate that people aren't uh, people aren't looking for that information. They want that information in context. So yeah, less is more. Um, this is one of the key elements to look at. Okay. One of the downsides of having a really innovative and I'm using innovative technologies as a way to uh, present your information is that it really quickly comes out of, um, well, it's outdated very quickly uh, and it doesn't always work. And one of the key elements was the virtual version of the house. And uh, we had one that had a curved screen. It was fantastic, um, but it made people sick. Okay, um, there was motion sickness, and so the kids loved it. I thought that was wicked, um, but you know that sort of element. So we've had to rejig that and put it into a new uh, flat screen television and use a new game engine. And this is much better, and kids love it um, because it, we've been built in an educational aspect to it. And every time we walk into the room, uh, the thing that triggers in interest is that it is, has an Xbox controller, okay? And you should see the excitement on it. And I know it's laden, full of history. Uh, so that's that sort of element. So as a curator, I see my principal role as being to teach and to engage. And this was the objective of uh, a project that I did, which was the Governor's Library project. And it's proved a really great success, okay? Um, in the sense that it does use the sense of what we were, Kylie was talking about this morning, is about objects to stimulate conversation, okay? And it very much is a project that draws on my overseas uh, summer school uh, study trip um, in 2012, and in particular the emphasis on excursion-based learning or learning outside the classroom. And this was to refurnish or uh, reimagine one of the key rooms in the house, which is the governor's library. Sorry, this is some of the stuff the kids interact with on the virtual house. That's my governor's library project. So as an historian, the governor's library was a particularly important room. It was a hub of the power and where all the acts um, and laws were made. Okay? It would have been a hive of activity. Okay? One of the most effective and traditional venues for teaching history is arguably the historic house, for it is the power of these museums more than any other to evoke history and to put the visitor into direct contact with objects. Okay? So this is a project that I've done. Uh, we were given all this, okay, so this is one of the cheapest projects I've done because uh, sadly uh, everyone is getting rid of their books uh, and uh, their furniture, their colonial furniture. So I was really um, overrun with people wanting to contribute and most of, and the chairs were uh, being lent from Parliament um, because they had nowhere to store it. Storage is a major problem. The papers are facsimiles and they're themed. So next month I'm changing them to a look at the um, Lamington National Park. 
Okay, so kids get to interact and play with it. But it is object based and one of the key objects that really gets people, kids going is uh, the telephone. Okay, and I think that that's where the success of this project is, is um, evidenced by the sight of 25 school children trying to squeeze in between the chairs to get closer to the table and objects, um, followed by a burst of questions. Of particular fascination is this 1890s telephone, a telephone with no numbers on it. How did they ring anyone? So a lively and progressive interrogation follows from this object to a discussion of why telephone numbers in the colon colonial telephone numbers initially only had three numbers to the historical significance of Old Govern House being one of the first houses in Brisbane to have a telephone installed in the 1880s. So we'll go back to my little chap um, and, and how he, my opening story about the young student who believed that historians didn't do much. Um, and I'm very happy to report that this student was very engaged and was animated in the governor's library discussion. And when we were um, passing the other half of his class and his group as they came out of the virtual house presentation, he said to the other group, it's really cool. Okay? So I, of course, had an inward fist pump of success because I had engaged and hopefully taught something of the past because it is through play that we do so much of our learning and we learn best when we are having fun. And I just, if I've got time, have I got time? Yep, I'm taking it, they're not saying anything. I just want to really talk about my project that has come again from overseas uh, thing which is the voice in the walls and uh, again it's about interacting children um, actively with history and it's called the voice in the walls project and I just want to show you some of the photos it is a play um, it's an interactive play with headphones and the kids are sent on a quest to help find the child protection act okay of um, 1899 to help save uh, Mary who uh, is a housemaid a young housemaid and there are two live actors and we use the whole house it was in response to the fact that uh, QUT as um, old government house is in a campus and during December and January it's a very quiet place to be um, and we're trying to bring people in there. Okay, so the kids come in here, they lie down, and then they walk around the various points of the house. And these are just some of the images that we've taken. So there's two live actors. One is a house, uh, house, no, sorry, is a nursemaid, and the other is uh, Lord Lamington. Okay, and so this is a child engaging. They have to research, and here he is presenting these elements. So this is using space. Um, and uh, in a different way, in an innovative way. And that's a wonderful thing. And I just wanted to say that this, one of the things about this is that all you want to do is to try and inspire our interest in history. And so the first performances of this play were exceptionally well received. And one of the responses was, all right, you have officially amazed me. That was absolutely incredible. I loved the voice in the wall so much. Israel, age nine. But this is the best one, and I love this, and I'm going to finish on this one, because it is uh, about amazing kids. That was the best thing that I have ever done in my entire life. <laughs> Tom, age nine. Okay. So with two stories to tell and new ways to tell them, the story of Old Government House continues. Thank you.